Hallelujah. Y'all doing okay this morning? I hope you are. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Glad to be in the house of the Lord. Are you glad you still this is you still have freedom and liberty to come Amen. to the house of the Lord? Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Guess you don't really know how what a benefit it is until you can't do it anymore, right? Thank you, Lord. All right, listen, we're going to read this. We're going to read this whole chapter. It's a lot of reading. Just bear with me. You know, the Apostle Paul told young Timothy, the pastor, he said, don't forsake the reading, the public reading of the scriptures. Amen. So we're going to do that. And we're going to read this story out of Hebrews. So just real quick, just to give you a little bit of background information. The book of Hebrews was a letter written and scholars say that we don't know exactly who wrote it, but many people believe in the early church believed that the Apostle Paul wrote it. The reason that they kind of contend whether it was Paul or not is that the Greek seems a little bit different, like the way the structure is. But uh, certainly um, the early church, like I said, believed, attributed this letter to the Apostle Paul. And whoever wrote this letter had to have a very, very deep understanding of the new covenant and how Jesus is the fulfillment of the new covenant. And the reason that the letter was written and possibly the reason maybe the Apostle Paul wouldn't have signed it was because it was written specifically to Christians that had previously been born and raised Jews. And they had given their heart to the Lord, and now they were suffering great persecution. And again, I don't think that you nor I really can understand what the kind of persecution they were suffering because of the fact that we've been born and raised in America. We might have been laughed at a couple of times, and people may try to come against us. But it got to the point over here where... If they literally, if a father's son became a Christian, they would hold a public funeral for him, even though he didn't die. Now, I want you to get that. The family and all the friends would gather, and they'd hold a public funeral, pretending that he had died, and basically that he was now dead to them. Uh, if they owned businesses, people would no longer go to their business to buy, to buy goods. Uh, people would sell to them. And so the church in Jerusalem had become very, very poor. And that's really what the letter to the Corinthians is all about. That the Apostle Paul, and even in the book of Acts, was gathering up offerings to try to bring to the church of Jerusalem because they were hurting so bad over there financially and the persecution that, that they were experiencing. And so they started to venture back to the old way of life. They started to venture back to the old religion. Uh, looking back to Old Testament sacrifices and putting their hope and trust in that. And so the writer is telling them, no, you can't go backwards. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that you're looking for. See, for you and I, if we we're going to try to make that, how does this affect me today, preacher? Well, whatever your old world or life used to be, what did you used to do in your old life whenever things were coming against you, how you would try to, to make yourself feel better or, or to try to escape the pain. What did you used to do? I'm not gonna, I don't have to sit here and list it all. You know in your heart and mind what you used to do. I know what I used to do uh, and when I didn't know any better. And then even after I gave my heart to the Lord, many times the enemy would allow trials and tribulations to come into my life to try to tempt me to go back towards the things that I previously had done. Oh, this is just too bad. This is too much. I got to take a little exit strategy. Okay, so whatever it was that we used to do, that, that, that would be similar to what was happening with them. So for them, it was religion. And for you and I, maybe it was some type of a way of life that we used to live in and a habit that we used to engage in. So we're going to go ahead and read. But, but I got to tell you that this, this particular chapter is specifically about how God views people that choose to live for him. I want you to get that. This whole chapter, it's, it's connected to Old Testament believers, but, but the idea behind it is that, listen to me, church, there's been a great cloud of witnesses that has gone before you and I. You understand that? If you and I face some persecution tomorrow for the decisions that we make for Christ, I got to tell you that, that this isn't something new. Amen. I got to tell you that the Bible, I don't know how much of the Bible you've read. I don't know how much you've studied, but I got to tell you, this isn't something new. God's people have experienced persecution and separation uh, for a long time. And God sees that situation and he knows that it's taking place. And I got to tell you that in his heart and in his eyes, it's a very precious thing 
His people are a very precious thing to God. And that's kind of what this chapter is about. It's about faith and it's about the people of God. So let's go ahead and read. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. Boy, I can tell you, I can preach an hour on that. I got I mean, to stay focused and I got to keep reading. But really, think about that. What is faith? <clears throat> faith is sometimes an abstract thing. Like it says, it's the substance. Of something hoped for. Substance is something you can see and feel and hold. And, and you can taste it. But, but faith says that there's a substance there. Okay. Of things hoped for. But the evidence is you can't see it. It's there. You, 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 it is impossible to please God without faith, child of God. Sometimes there's things in this life that you cannot see and you don't understand why you're going through things and the enemy will try to divert you and he will try to trick your mind and he will try to pull you off course and he will try to convince you, oh man, this stuff isn't even real. Can you see it? Can you taste it? Can you feel it? I'm here to tell you that God wants you to have a relationship with him and he wants his spirit on the inside of you to convince you that he is real and that his ways are real. So faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders or the Old Testament saints obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. You can do whatever you want with the creation story. You can do whatever you want with evolution. You can go big bang. Whatever you think you want to do, my friend. The word of God says this. That God created the things that you and I see out of something that was not previously there. I'm talking about, I don't know how it happened, but I know that he spoke. And I'm talking all the way down to the atomic level. And I know I've said this before, and I don't know that I can do a good job of explaining it, but I learned in junior high that atoms are in constant motion. Electrons and protons are in constant motion. That means that everything on this earth that is made, the things that we visibly see are made up of atoms. That means this chair is made up of an atom and that, that of atoms and these things are moving right now. But yet I can go sit down and it becomes solid. I can sit in that thing. How does he do that? I don't know. But he framed the world and spoke them into existence out of things. There wasn't metal in existence and he hired a couple of welders and they started putting the structure together. No, he spoke and atoms coalesced and came into existence and the earth was formed and he formed man out of the clay of pristine soil. There was no sin in him. There was no corruption in him. And he breathed his life-giving breath into man. And he wants to breathe his life-giving breath into you. And he wants to reveal himself and show himself to be true. Let God be true and let every man be a liar. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Cain brought an animal, an innocent animal, and offered up its blood because he understood he was a guilty man. How did he learn that? From his father Adam. But Cain brought the works of his own hands, testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet he speaks. His testimony still speaks today, Christian. Abel's name is in the Bible. The Word of God says in another place that Abel's righteous blood cries out from the ground. He was the first martyr in the Bible. He took a stand for God. He believed God at his word. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony. That he pleased God. What a beautiful testimony. Amen. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For the, he that comes to God. Must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Boy it's just a simple word that's so powerful. Without faith it is impossible. You can't see him. Oh no he will allow you to see him if you want to see him. But they, if people want physical evidence. The scientific method. It's not real until you prove it to me. No, 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 my friend. That's not what the Lord said. And he's the creator of this universe. He, it goes his way. Not your way. Not the scientist's way. His way. He's a rewarder of those that will diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing where he went. 
By faith he sojourned, or he journeyed in the land of promise as a stranger or a pilgrim in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. <clears throat> Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful. Who had promised. You see, you see the large picture here. God's trying to show you and I as his people that there's been a cloud of witnesses that has gone before us, but he's also telling the whole story from the beginning of the year to the end. He's talking about it along the way. That God through faith, that those that are going to believe, God that God through faith, believe that God created this earth. Believe that God flooded this earth because of the disobedient and those that refused and rejected the word of God. Believe that God through faith called a man named Abraham out and through him created a nation called Israel that ultimately he would end up giving us Jesus, amen, to die on the cross for our sin. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead. Abraham, good as dead, 99 years old. How are you going to produce offspring? Sarah Nighy, her, her womb bound and dry. And, oh, Abraham can't even hardly get up without sciatic pain. And yet, God does it. And so many as the stars of the sky and multitude as the sand which is by the seashore. The, the children of Abraham are the children of faith according to Galatians chapter 3. That means that, that, that not only is it Israel, but it's though that offspring that has been produced through Jesus. The multitude upon the sands of the shore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Can I just say that real quick? <clears throat> you may never see all the promises that you felt like God spoke to you. See, sometimes people get frustrated. They feel like God showed them something. I got to tell you that sometimes I don't understand every pathway that my life has taken. There's been a lot of things that I've done, and sometimes I question, was that even the Lord? Was it me? You understand what I'm getting at? Sometimes I like to reflect. Was this God? Or was this me? What's, what's going on? But I know this, that it's not over. This, this stage of life is not over until I breathe my last breath here and take my first breath there. <clears throat> but I do realize this also. Everything that I felt like God told me was going to happen may not happen on this side. And guess what? I'm okay with that. Because really and truly, I just want God's will for my life. Even though sometimes I've, I, my self-will gets in the way. <clears throat> when I pray at night, I can tell you. I'm like, Lord, please, let your will for my life be done. Amen? So they, they had the promises. They saw them far off. They were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from where they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Are you going to return, Christian? Whenever the trials of life start to grab a hold of you and start to try to pull you back, are you going to return to your old way of thinking and your old way of doing things? Or by the grace of God, are you going to hold on to the Lord and allow him to continue to bring you to the place where he desires for you to be? Amen. But now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly country. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared for them a city. Do you see? I don't mean to keep stopping because I know that I can't. I don't want to keep you here all day. Okay, but I, but I want to say something. Do you see <clears throat> what's going on? Is they're the, 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 the writer is telling us that God created this earth. And that he is producing a plan. And he is producing a people. And the people on this earth are strangers and pilgrims. And they're on a journey. And the people that have God, that know the Lord, amen, through faith, uh, have a different spirit about them. And they, they're, they're living their lives for something different. They're not living. Oh, I think, <clears throat> I don't know I've said this before, but, oh, I think uh, Destin might be the place for me. I don't mind visiting I'll be honest with you, I probably wouldn't really mind being, look, they got a pretty cool governor over there. Okay. But, but what I'm trying to say is that's not the city that I'm looking for. The city that I'm looking for is the city of God. Amen. I'm just a pilgrim and a stranger on this earth traveling through by the grace of God. Amen. And I, and I hope that you can see that and that you yourself can, can understand that by faith. 
By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall your seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from where also he received him in a figure. So Isaac was a type of Christ, amen, to be sacrificed by his father, his only begotten son, and that, and that Abraham believed that God could and would raise him from the dead. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. You know what? I love this right here. <clears throat> this next verse. This is so powerful. You, you know, the children of Israel were stuck in Egypt for 400 years. They had become slaves. Under the lead, Jacob, Jacob, you remember the story of Joseph? He was thrown into the pit. And then he became the second in command under Pharaoh over the whole nation of Egypt. And then his, his people came back and, 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 and under Joseph's leadership, they were given the whole land of Goshen, which was a, which was a beautiful uh, place for their sheep to graze. And for four, but, but then another Pharaoh came and they became slaves in Egypt for 400 years. <clears throat> but before Joseph died, look what it says. By faith, Joseph, when he died, he made mention of the departing of the children of Israel. So they were slaves for 400 years, but Joseph, before he died, said, hey, one day, y'all are about to get up and get out. You hear me? And I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I can feel this in my bones right now. Egypt had been good to Joseph. You understand that? His own brother had tied him up, bound him up, threw him in a pit, lied to their daddy, and told him that a wild animal had eaten him. He ends up going, and he's ministering in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife turns around and tries to make him have sex with her. And then when he refuses to do it, she lies about him. He gets thrown in prison. He gets thrown in prison. And, and, and yet at the same time, he holds on to the Lord in the midst of all these trials and tribulations. And when the time is right, God delivers him out, raises him up, puts him second in command. And after all of that, his own people. And you know, he told his brothers, he said, what you meant for evil, God has flipped it around and turned it for something good. Mm -hmm. The whole time, Joseph never stopped believing God. Amen. And look, when he was about to die, he said, you know what? I'm thinking to myself, I would be thinking Egypt hadn't been all that bad to me. But guess what? This ain't my city, my friend. This place is not my home. And he said, when, there's coming a day when you're going to get up and get out of here. And when you get up and get out of here, look what it says. He mentioned the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. <laughs> you know what he said? He said, I'm about to pass over to the other side and my bones are going in the ground. But guess what? Whenever it comes time for you to get up and get out, I want you to grab my bones and I want you to bring them out of here with you because this place is not my home. And what God has promised our father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he will come bring it to pass. And whenever you move into that promised land that he had for you, why don't you do me a favor and bring my bones with you? Because guess what? Egypt is not my home, my friend. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. Hallelujah. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Well, I tell you, I could just preach on these people all day long. Have you ever thought of, of these things? You know, it says that whenever they put Moses and they hit him in those bulrushes that they put him, his mom and his sister hid him in the reeds by the Nile Delta. And Pharaoh's daughter went out there and she was taking a bath. And one of the servants found the baby. It said, look, it's one of the Hebrew boys. I'm telling you right now how you know it's a Hebrew boy because they were different. They were circumcised. He had the sign of the covenant in him. That's how they knew he was a Hebrew boy. And I'm not trying to be weird, but can you imagine now Moses, they bring him into Pharaoh's house and he grows up in Pharaoh's house and he realizes that he's different than all the other boys around him. And I don't know, even somehow it might seem weird on one day, whenever all these Hebrew slaves are doing whatever they're doing, he somehow, I guarantee you it happened. I, I can't prove it, but I guarantee you it happened. God allowed Moses to see one of those other Hebrew boys. And then he realizes, why do I look like they do, but I'm living over here in this house? 
The Lord revealed to him. So Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And look what he chose. When it came time to choose. Who are you going to live for and where are you going to live? Are you going to live in Egypt? Are you going to live in the world? Or are you going to be a child of God? It says he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That's a good word for you, Christian. That's a good word for you, amen. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, the anointed one that would to come, greater riches than treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, the first, one of the first types of the cross, right? Thousands of years before Jesus would ever show up. It's the, it's the most beautiful story, man. You can't make this stuff up. Jesus was crucified on Passover. This is the first Passover. They took an innocent lamb. They cut its throat. They collected his blood. They painted it on the doorpost. And then 1,500 years later, Jesus dies on the cross on the same day. How do you, how do you make this stuff up? The rest of the world's out there just blind, walking around like a person with a broken GPS. Bumping into things. Can't see where they're going. I'm not making fun of them because Lord knows we've all been there. Lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land which the Egyptians are saying to do. They tried to do it too but guess what? They were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab perished. Not with them that believed. Not when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, Samson and Jephthah, of David and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yeah, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder or sawn in half. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins. They were destitute, afflicted, and tormented. And this is really the first of my message this morning. Of whom the world was not worthy. That's the title of my message this morning. I want you to know this, Christian. If you're a believer today, if you're born again, if you're watching on video and you're a born again believer, I want you to know that in God's eyes, the world is not worthy. The world, listen to me. This isn't arrogant. This isn't self-righteous. This is the heart of God. This evil, wicked world is not worthy of your presence. Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and dens and in caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us, should not be made perfect. Now that last verse right there, I just want you to know, what does that mean? God having provided some better thing for us. What do you think that better thing for us is? Anybody want to, I know, I know I've already worn you down with a bunch of reasons. What do you think that better thing for us is? God provided some better thing for us. That better thing is Jesus. Amen. The, the better thing is the new covenant. That's what he's trying to tell these Hebrew Christians. You're trying to go backwards to your old way of life, but I'm here to tell you, God gave you and I something better. The fulfillment of the plan in Jesus. So that day without us should not be made perfect. You know, if you're born again this morning, I want you to know that you're part of the family of God. Amen. How did that happen? You can think back to your way of life and when you first got saved and more than likely somebody at some point in time told you some truth or some element of truth of the gospel maybe it just started off with one little comment and six months later somebody else said something and a year later somebody else said something then maybe somebody invited you to church i don't know how it happened but you got your story just like i have my story you heard the gospel 
the good news. Amen. And whenever there was a day, whenever that good news penetrated your heart and you surrendered your heart and your life to God, if you're born again this morning, something like that happened. And, you, and when you responded by faith to the gospel, you know what he did? He took your guilt and he gave you his righteousness. I got to tell you, whether you understand that or not, that's what the Bible teaches. You're going to just have to take my word for it this morning. Whenever you surrendered to the truth of the gospel, you recognized that you were a sinner without God. Your life was undone and what you needed was Jesus. Hallelujah. When you said, Lord, come into my heart, forgive me of my sin and give me new life. You might not have even said it like that, but you said something. You might have just said his name, Jesus, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus, and when you called on his name, hallelujah, something happened. You know what happened? The Holy Spirit came to live in your heart. He took your guilt. He gave you his righteousness, and now his spirit lives in you. And I got to tell you something, Christian. His spirit on the inside of you is what makes you different than the world around you. Let me say that again. His spirit on the inside of you is what makes you different than the world around you. How many times can we break that down? It's not because you don't drink. It's not because you don't smoke. It's not because you don't chew. It's not because you don't go with girls that do. It's not because you don't do all these things. Do, 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 whatever I do. Oh, I'm so righteous. I'm so holy. I'm so pretty. I'm so beautiful. I just, I'm just the pleasant of the Lord. He just loves me so much because I don't, no, no, no. It ain't got nothing. No, your righteousnesses are like filthy rags. And I don't think I can preach that hard enough. I'm here to tell you this morning, if he's pleased with you, it's because you chose the one that he's pleased with. And he's clothed you in him. His name is Jesus. That's the righteousness God's looking for, my friend. Now, what I will tell you is this, is that when you begin to understand that, you begin to rest in that. See, there's a rest that waits the children of God. When you begin to rest in the finished work of Jesus, and you begin to allow yourself to see yourself clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, then guess what happens? You start to begin to see a spiritual release take place in your life. You start to begin to see bondages broken by the power of the Holy Spirit. You begin to see mindsets changed in your mind and in your heart. You begin to see the, the Lord conforming you, molding you into the image of Christ. The Spirit of God in you is what makes you different than the world around you. Do I have to say it again? Not because you don't do what they do. The reason you don't do what they do if you don't do what they do is because of the Spirit of God in you. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. And the only reason I preach it that hard is because the Lord knows I was, I was that Christian. I mean, some of the silliest stuff, I've shared that with y'all before. I used to still dip about a can and a half a day, and I'd be in church, and I'd be, and I'd see somebody smoking on the side. I'm like, man, that dude's still smoking, man. I'm kind of holy, whatever. And I'm over here, as soon as I leave, I'm about to shove a can and dip in my mouth. How do you even get to that self-righteous level? I don't know how I did, but it did. And then after I really got sanctified, I'm like, man, I'm raising two hands in church. Look at that brother over there. He's barely lifting one hand. How in the world? I don't know, but it did. His spirit in you is what makes you different than the world around you. I got a warning, though, for anybody that would watch or anybody that would listen. People that reject the Lord and his truth are part of a world that grows more evil every day. Listen, you can be a Christian and you begin to reject the truth of God. You begin to reject. I have seen it in people's lives, my friend. The Lord is all about Jesus, and he's all about the sacrifice that he provided. And whenever people in their self-righteous, hypocritical attitude begin to reject the truth of the gospel, something starts to happen on the interior of that person. And it will begin to drive them. Don't let the devil lie to you, Christian. The word of God is real. Jesus is real. Don't open up the door to deception and lies. No, I'm here to tell you that God provided you a gift and his name is Jesus. And the gift is that he died on the cross and he gave you his righteousness. Warning. People that reject the Lord and his truth are part of a world that's growing more evil every day. Through evil, there's an ongoing persecution of God's people that's taking place. And those that receive his truth become his children. That's John. John chapter 1. To those that would believe on him, he gave them power to become the sons of God. Are you his children this morning? Are you his children this morning on video? I hope that you've gotten born again. How do I get born again? Call on the name of Jesus, Christian or unbeliever, whoever you are. Just call on his name and say, I need you. Come into my heart. He knows. 
we don't need to get some little some little uh, prayer. You know, and there ain't nothing wrong with a prayer. But what I'm saying is man, we can go through the ritual of a prayer and it doesn't even mean anything. What God wants is a prayer from the heart. When you believe from the heart and confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Then you shall be saved. It's got to be from the interior. It can't just be some mindless words and lip service. No, God's looking for the heart. Amen. Amen. Those that receive his truth become his children. God sees his children and people as very special. That's one of the main things I'm really trying to point out to you today. The world isn't worthy of you, Christian, and God sees his people as very special. They represent him on earth. If you're born again today, you've been born into a new family. Amen. The old you died with Jesus on the cross, was buried with him in the tomb, and a new you was born again with him through resurrection. God is your father, and the Holy Spirit is your helper. Amen. Amen. You know, when trying to describe an angry, evil world that's in opposition towards the people of God, there can be no better example than the Apostle Paul. Whenever you think about the life of the Apostle Paul and the things that he went through, if you remember Acts, I think it's Acts chapter maybe eight and nine about Stephen the martyr. I was telling somebody the other day, what are you, you bored? You do when I was cleaning up the tables and I always say that, but I think it's, I think it's cool that story about Stephen. He was the, the first recorded martyr in the book of Acts. And, and that's where the word deacon comes from. Diakonos, it means servant. But the idea behind it was a table servant. See, the first deacons, Stephen and Philip and all those guys, they were actually handing out food to those that were poor and to the widow. And, and that's, that's the idea of the word behind a deacon is that he's a servant. I mean, Philip and Stephen, especially Stephen, was filled with the Holy Ghost, the wisdom of God. And he began to preach a message. Amen. I don't mean to get into all that right now, but he began to preach a message and the world hated it. Religion hated it. And they literally killed him. <coughs> and the Bible says that Saul, before his conversion, was consenting to the death of Stephen. In other words, he was like, yeah, he was a religious leader. He was the high-ranking official that was present for that stoning. And he said, yeah, hit him one more time for me. And I've oftentimes thought about, because when you read about the Apostle Paul in his life, you can see that God got a hold of that man. God got a hold of that man, and God broke that man down. And I'm telling you right now, I get emotional thinking about it. How many times he must have thought and reimagined in his mind those rocks hitting him. Now, I don't think, you know, God would leave him in condemnation, but how many times must he re remember the visual of that taking place and that he was part of it? And yet God would love him so much that he would radically change his life. Amen. Wow. But he was angry. Before God changed him, he was angry. That spirit of religion was part of that evil world that was coming against what God was really doing. The spirit in him. Is the same spirit. The spirit that was in him is the same spirit that runs the world today. We can give it different names. I know I've said it a lot. Spirit of religion, the spirit of man helping man, which is another way for me to say the spirit of Babel, the spirit of Jezebel, the spirit of Antichrist. It's against God is what you need to know. And what God is really doing and the people that God uses to do what he's doing. See, Paul, before Saul, before his conversion, hated what was going on. The spirit that was in him was not the Holy Spirit. He was operating under a different spirit, and he was condemning the people of God. He was condemning the church. You know, I was thinking about this, this illustration. The spirit, I'm talking about that bad spirit, is kind of like a herpetic virus. Like, whether it's the simplex or the zoster, they hide themselves deeply embedded within the nervous system. And when stress to the human body comes out, guess what? The person, it starts to become aroused and then becomes angry and it creates havoc. And then it goes back and it secretly hides again, waiting for another time for it to be riled up. Similarly, evil's presence in the world is deeply embedded. I got to tell you that the spirit of Antichrist is deeply embedded and it has dug its heels in, so to speak, and established this world as its territory. I'm here to tell you that the devil ain't going to quit. He's not going to quit, Christian. You got to understand that. He's mad. He's angry. He hates God. He knows his demise is coming. He's read the book, my friend. You, you and I might not have read the book. But the enemy knows the book. 
He knows what the end says. He knows that he's going to be cast into a bottomless pit during the thousand year millennial reign of Christ. And then he will be loosed for a short period of time to re-deceive the nations. And then after that, it's done for him. Gehenna, the lake of fire, eternal torment. He will meet the false prophet, the antichrist, and all those that have taken the mark of the beast. His demise is on around the corner, Christian. And he knows, and he's angry, and he's bloodthirsty. And guess what? He can't get to God. So what does he do? He comes after God's mark, God's possession. You, his inheritance, God's children, God's people. I got to tell you, the next time you're going through something and you feel weighted down and you feel like people are coming against you or whatever it is that you're going through and you feel like for a second, is it worth it? Yes, it's worth it, Christian. It's worth it to hold on to the Lord until the very end. It's going to be worth it all. Whenever you hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. It's going to be worth it. Paul operating under this spirit attacked the early church, thinking that he was doing God's service. He had Christians thrown into jail, murdered in the middle of the plan. A spirit greater than the one that had Paul gripped, knocked him to his knees and radically changed his life. Has that spirit knocked you to your knees? Amen. From that point moving forward, Paul was driven by the spirit of God and his life was never the same. 2 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25 describes some of the maltreatment that he received. 2 Corinthians 11, 24, 25. I'm not really going to turn there for sake of time, but it describes some of the maltreatment. It says that he was whipped three times. He was beaten with rods five times. He was imprisoned. He was shipwrecked. He Listen, he would go from city to city and during, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was built on a hill, a hill. And you had to travel down, and there was all kind of rocks and little hiding places, and robbers would hide in there. That's what happened to the Good Samaritan story, right? Little robbers would hide in there, and they'd wait till you. You're just like over here praising the Lord. Hallelujah. God's good. Look, at, look This is the day that the Lord has made. I'm leaving Jerusalem, and I'm going to go down to Jericho, or I'm going to go wherever, and I'm going to spread the gospel. And all of a sudden, a bunch of robbers jump out, beat, beat the snot out of you, steal your clothes. Steal your clothes, leave you naked. Yep. <clears throat> leave you naked in the cold. Now that's pretty embarrassing yeah. when you finally make it down the hill. Yeah. Nevertheless, those are the kinds of things that happened to him in his endeavors to live for the Lord. He received these beatings by the hand of Rome as he Operated in the spirit of God. The world that once loved and embraced him. Now he loves. Isn't that true for all Christians? Mm -hmm. When you truly turn your back on the world. The world that used to love you. They don't, they, they don't see you the same. Yeah. Amen. Amen. When you start, really start to take a stand for the Lord. I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. They might receive. I mean I, I had a conversation with this guy last night. I was sharing. I was sharing with somebody this morning. Who was a patient. And I guess it was about 11 o'clock at night. He's like, man, my leg's messed up, dude. I go to L.A. in about a month. I got a gig, dude. I'm a bass player. I play Sid Vicious. I run up and down on the stage. And I'm like, you, you, what you know about all that? And I'm like, well, I used, I used to be all about rock and roll, bro. But, you know, I'm a preacher now, man. The Lord changed my heart. And he's like, oh, but Christian music, Christian rock and roll is the best seller, man. You get you some lyrics together. And then, man, you'll be speaking in front of 20,000. I'm like, dude. Look, you started it, so let me say what I got to say. It's a different spirit. It's a different spirit that wants to be seen. I don't care what they say. If it's coming out of that and the world is embracing it, it is not the spirit of the Holy Spirit that was the spirit of the Christ that is purporting the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Oh, they might have some lyrics here and there to draw people in. And I told him, I said, man, you ain't never heard the scripture that says that Satan presents himself as an angel of light. He clothes himself up and he makes himself pretty. Trust me, these people are not doing the work of the Lord. And I'm not saying that they don't think they are sometimes, but they're not. But the whole world is under this spirit. And, and guess what? When you, and he, I mean, he didn't like that. But he, he started it. <laughs> I was minding my own business trying to fix his leg. <laughs> and he started it. I got to tell you that. Young people, 
if you're still in school, I don't know, the world around you is lying. They don't know any better. They're deceived. If you, people at work, the world around you is, they're deceived. This is the truth. Amen. And we got to, we got to learn to believe this and to ask God to give us the strength that we need in order to live it. Amen. In the end, he truly is a New Testament example of today, today's title. The world was not worthy of this man. When it was all said and done, he writes 2 Timothy. If you've read 2 Timothy, he's at the end. He said, he said I've run the race. My, my, the time is now at hand. And he's writing to Timothy. He said, if you make it back over here before the winter, would you do me a favor and bring the scrolls and also that tunic? He was in the, a prison known as the Mamertine prison. It was a pit dug in the ground in, in Rome. And it was cold and it was damp down there and it was dark. And he asked Timothy to bring him the, let, the writings that he could read the word of God in an in a outer garment so that he could keep warm. But he knew. He said, he said, my time's up. And it wasn't long after that that Nero ordered for his execution and they brought him out and they cut his head off. According to church tradition, Paul's head was cut off. Mm. The world was not worthy of this man. Amen. What is our problem today, Christian? What is it that we face that the Holy Spirit cannot get you and I through? The God of glory wants to protect us. He wants to go before us in the battle. He wants to give us victories in life. He wants to partner with us and use us to reveal himself. See, I might have known that they were singing that song today, but I did not write these things in order because they were singing the song. But in that song, I went into the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. See, the devil's trying to steal stuff from people. Amen. And God wants through Christ to give you and I victory and triumph so that we will go back and we will get these victories. And these small victories will encourage us in our walk and faith with God ultimately so that we will do what it is that he's called us to do, which is to be light in the midst of darkness. That's right. That's right. I have seen preachers apologetically preach that message. Uh, preachers that I respect. We're preaching a message on personal evangelism today. And they would begin to talk about personal evangelism. I know that this makes you feel uncomfortable. But can I tell you something, Christian? God is not asking you to do anything that, you, that, that he expects you to do it on your own. He doesn't expect you to do it on your own. He's just asking you to give your life to him and to surrender your life to him and let his spirit work in you. And when the time is right, he will open up the door and he will work through you. Amen. Amen. Don't get all stressed out about it. I can remember one time, you know, the, one of the first times that me and Robert went to prison ministry. I mean, if you don't know Robert's story, I mean, he's given me permission to use his testimony. Uh, but he, he got saved in prison. He was a drug dealer. He got saved in prison. And and when he got saved, he got radically saved. You know? They used to call him Goldberg. And they said, hey, go get Goldberg. He'll buy some of that peanut butter from the whatever. It wasn't the store, I don't think. It was the, the what? The kitchen. The kitchen. They'd, take, they'd pilfer peanut butter and other kinds of stuff from the kitchen, oatmeal. And, 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 and they, they would sell it through the bars. And that night, it was, I think, resurrection, the night before resurrection, Saturday, Sunday, before. Saturday the Saturday before, the Lord, that night, the Lord touched him. Oh, and he woke up, he said, I wasn't the same man. <coughs> he didn't even know why. They said, go get Goldberg, he'll buy some of that peanut butter. <coughs> and Goldberg said, nope, I ain't the same. I don't know what happened, but I ain't the same. And I know one thing, I can't buy that peanut butter through the bars no more. See, God will grab a hold of you and he will begin to change you. That's right. Amen. And he wants to partner with you. Amen. Amen. And he expects that you and I will begin to work with him as he ch does the change in our life. But see, even with all of that, whenever Robert got out and God was doing such a powerful work in his life, I remember when he got out of prison, I met him not long after that. And we started the Bible study and he was, he, he was just so hungry for the, for the will and the work of God. But he, but there was a people kept trying to tell him he was supposed to be a preacher, and and he was like, because that's what everybody thinks. Everybody thinks that just because you talk for the Lord or you quote a scripture, oh, you're going to be a preacher. It's like, well, hold on a second. No, we're all supposed to be witnesses. Can I tell you that? Just 
Take your time, Christian. Don't walk out of here be feeling beat up and defeated. No, 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 no. Take your time. The Lord will open the door and you'll be able to share your testimony. If you, even if you don't know the scripture, you'll be able to say what God did for you. I guarantee you, God will put someone in your path that has gone through something like what you have been through. And you will be able to share with them, hey, this is what God did for me. You know, and, and when it was all said and done, you know, Robert's like, man, I just want to serve the Lord. Amen. Don't let nobody turn you into a preacher if that's not what God's called you to do. Amen. But but let God turn you into a witness, my friend. A prophet of God. Hallelujah. I would that the spirit of God would be on all God's people and that all God's people would prophesy the truth. Amen. Amen. He expects that we will work with him. So the spirit of God is in you. Let's take a look real quick. I just got a couple of scriptures and then I'm going to shut it down because I know I've already... Been preaching a long time. John chapter 14, 15 through 18. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray to the Father and he will give you another comforter. That's talking about the Holy Spirit. That he will abide or live with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, that's this comforter, whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not. Neither does the world know him. But you know him for he dwells with you. And he shall be in you. Amen. See, that's the beauty of the gospel. This right here, Jesus saying, you know what he's saying? He's saying, I'm going to go to the cross. Right now, the Holy Spirit's been with Israel. These disciples were, were Jews. The Holy Spirit's been with the nation of Israel. You know him. He's been with you. You grew up in this. The world doesn't know him because they've been worshiping false gods, right? But listen, he's been with you, but he's going to be in you. Because see, when he went to the cross and you put your faith in Christ... The Holy Spirit comes to live in you. Amen. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. That's what it means to be born again. The Spirit of God lives in you and he starts to conform you into the image of Christ. I'm going to close with this last scripture. Musicians, y'all can come to the front. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Really and truly, I could just read this whole first part right here. I'm going to break it down real quick. I got three minutes. Second Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 1. He's, pre he's, he's writing a letter to a Gentile <coughs> church. Meaning people that weren't Jews and did not know God previously and probably had been raised to serve pagan gods, right? And now they're Christians. And he says, wherefore, like from this time forward, you need to lay aside all these things, malice and guile or bitterness and hypocrisy and envy and speaking bad about people. You need to put that stuff aside. And this is what you need to do. Like a newborn baby, you need to desire the sincere milk of the word. It's like a baby is hungry for milk. You ever seen a baby crying for milk? Just like a baby that cries for milk, you and I should be desiring, desperate for the word of God so that we could grow. If so be that you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. In other words, if you truly are saved and you have indeed tasted that God is good, then the next step should be that you would desire the sincere milk of the word. Lord, right now, for those that are watching, if we don't have a sincere desire for the, for the milk of the word, put that desire on the inside of us. Make us hungry or thirsty for the word of God. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed, indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. What does that mean? It means that God sent a living stone, his name was Jesus, and that the world rejected him. You also as lively stones, see the same life that was in Jesus has been spread to you. And he's the cornerstone of the foundation. And you and I are living stones that he's building a house. See, God's building a house, my friend, a place where his presence can dwell. God wants to dwell in the midst of his church. He wants to dwell in the midst of his people, his spirit to live in us. Amen. You're built up a spiritual house. You're a holy priesthood <clears throat> to offer up spirit. Not the priest over there with the collar on his neck. You, you are a holy priesthood. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in scripture. Behold I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. That's about Jesus. The elect one. 
the precious one, and he that believes on him shall not be confounded. You shall not be ashamed, my friend. If you, listen, the world might try to shame you. They might try to beat you down. They might try to do all kind of bad stuff to you on this side. But when it's all said and done and you breathe your last breath here and you take your first breath there, I'm here to tell you the word of God says, you will not be ashamed. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious. Is that you this morning? Do you believe he's precious? But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected, the same is made the head of the corner. Whether the world likes it or not, whether the world likes it or not, whether religion likes it or not, God's choice was Jesus. Amen. He's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word. Why? Because they're disobedient. Whereunto also they were appointed. But you are a chosen generation. I want you to know that. That word, that word generation is not talking about time frame. Yeah, sometimes people say a generation is 40 years or a biblical generation is 80 to 100. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about kindred. It's talking about a people with like-mindedness. You're a chosen generation. How were you chosen? You were chosen through Jesus. God knew before he created the earth that man would fall and that he would send Jesus. Amen. And when that message reached your heart, what did you do? You chose God through Jesus. Therefore, you're chosen. Chosen by God in Jesus. You're not just a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. The word of God says that he's made you and I kings and priests unto our God. You're a holy nation. You know, I was thinking about this this morning. Nations are separated by geographical boundaries and national borders. Not this one. This one is separated by the presence of God. I said it earlier. I said it ten times. I'm going to say it number eleven. What makes you different is the Spirit of God on the inside of you. You're your own sovereign nation right here. Represent. You're an ambassador of the Lord. An ambassador is an emissary that goes to another nation and he represents the nation that he comes from. Wherever the Lord sends his people, whether they live in China, H Town, whether they live wherever they live, it doesn't. It doesn't matter if the Spirit of God's on the inside of them, they are an ambassador yes. for the yes. King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You're a sovereign nation walking around on this earth, my friend. Your, your boundary is the Spirit of God. Oh, yeah, it's not the Pearl River that separates what Mississippi from Louisiana. It's not the Sabine River that separates Texas from Louisiana. No, 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 no. It's the presence of God on the inside of you that separates you from the darkened world around you. Not only that, but you're a peculiar people. <laughs> but you know that word peculiar, it's not exactly what we think it to mean anymore. That this word has lost its meaning through the ages of the English language. In the Greek, the idea is it's, 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 a, it's a surround about. It's almost like if you was to draw a dot. I, mean, I know I taught this probably the first message I think that we ever preached over here. It describes ownership. It's a surround it's actually a Greek, it's a preposition that means into. Into Christ. See, God has put you and I and surrounded us and describes ownership. You're his own very peculiar people. You're his own very separated people. You're holy because of the Holy Spirit in you. Amen. Amen. That's all I have this morning, but I want to encourage you as they lead us in a song that we would worship the Lord. That we would be reminded that a great cloud of witnesses has gone before us. That they suffered great persecution. That they probably oftentimes wondered, what did I get myself into? But in the end, they held on by the grace of God. Amen. And the Lord came through for them. Praise God. And the Lord's going to come through for us. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Praise God.